What I want you to do today is I want you to imagine some stuff with me. That's the, that's the theme of the TED Talk today. Uh, so I want you to imagine. Imagine a completely integrated world. Now think about that, a completely integrated world. Now some of you may sit here today and go, well, we're already there, but I can assure you we are not. Um, if you think about what the internet has done for us so far, uh, we can watch live events in China or in the Middle East. Uh, we can talk instantaneously with people in Australia or Asia. It's an extraordinary thing. But what allows us to do that is what's called the internet protocol. The internet protocol is a set of rules and guidelines that allow us to really focus and allow everybody in the world to connect with every other person in the world. It's called the internet protocol. The internet protocol forms a basis for all of the worldwide communication that occurs today. Every website you see, every phone call you make, uh, every email or text message you send is based on the internet protocol. What the internet protocol then as a basis allows us to do is to create and connect everything around the world, what we call today the internet of things. The internet of things is an ecosystem. It's an electronic ecosystem. Now, let me give you an example. In nature, we have ecosystems. So if you think of something like the Galapagos Islands or Hawaii, uh, the Hawaiian Islands or maybe the West Indies or something like that, these were ecosystems, very fragile, just beautiful ecosystems, but they were totally self-contained. They allowed us or allowed themselves the, the flora, the fauna, and the indigenous people to survive and to thrive within the closed ecosystem. But when explorers showed up, so when Christopher Columbus came to the West Indies, when Cook went in, uh, into Hawaii and stuff, what happened was you, imp you inst implemented into the ecosystem something unexpected. And as you are well aware from history with the West Indies, with, with the Hawaiian Islands and stuff, it had devastating effects. Um, the ecosystem being closed was not able to adopt and adapt to the changes that were occurring from the outside. And so this change, this module, if you will, that was brought into the system unexpectedly wreaked havoc. It came in, it, it debased the ecosystem. It didn't allow it to continue to develop. Now, the problem with that is that there were hundreds, if not thousands or millions of changes occurring to these ecosystems over millennia. You know, uh, changes in the tidal motions of the ocean, changes in climate, new species that were brought to, to shore, uh, various other things that were happening, yet that didn't destroy the ecosystem but it was bringing this other module in that did. In the world of information technology, in the world of technology, we refer to these ecosystems as integrated systems. Uh, and you'll hear us talk a lot about integrated systems. And one of the problems with all the stuff we recognize in, the, in like the West Indies and in Hawaii, one of the things that's, that we've discovered in the ecosystems is that when people talk about integrated systems, they sit there and they say, well, you can't have modules interfere with the system. Because if you let the module come in, it will destroy the system. And so we end up with this conversation around, are you gonna pursue an integrated technology? Or are you gonna take a modular approach to technology? And we make it a either or, a one versus the other. But let's think about that for a second. The most famous uh, technology integrated technology that we know of is Apple, right? And so many of you have Apple products and Apple is a closed system. Uh, you know, I can't take my Android phone and connect it to the Apple network. It doesn't work that way. Apple is a closed ecosystem. And so we look at that. If what people are saying holds true, then what's going to happen, what should have happened, is that Apple should have disappeared. Apple shouldn't be here. Android should have replaced it. Think about back in, for those of you who are a little bit older, uh, think about back when we had Betamax. Um, when VHS players first came out into the home, this is actual technology, believe it or not. Uh, when Betamax first came out into the homes, um, they were far superior to VHS players. 
But there was a fundamental difference. Sony took the approach of saying that Betamax was a Sony product and would not release the specifications on the technology so other companies could make it. Only Sony could make the Betamax. Sharp, another company, came out with what's called the VHS player. And Sharp took that technology and made it available to all of their technology providers and said, we want you to produce this. So when you walked into a store back in the early 1980s, right, or early, late 1970s, what you would see is you would see one Sony Betamax and you would see literally a hundred VHS players. And in a matter of 10 years, Sony went from controlling 100% of the market to not being in the market at all. Now, does that mean that the Sony Betamax technology disappeared? The answer is no. In fact, today, the descendants of that technology, you'll see at every major video studio. You'll see in, when you see remote vans coming in to do news remotes from different places, and they put that camera up on the shoulder, it's going to say Betacam, which is the child of the Betamax. So the technology didn't disappear. What it did was it evolved. So let's go back to our, our discussion about Hawaii. Why didn't, or, or the West Indies, why didn't it evolve? What happened? What, why was it so disruptive? And so for us in the technology fields today, the question really revolves around this idea of evolution versus disruption. And what do we do in terms of evolution and disruption? Well, the reality is we have to create an ecosystem in infrastructure and in ideas and in culture and in technology around the world that allows us to absorb and continue to develop both the evolutionary component of what we're talking about as well as the disruptive component. We must be able to do that. If we can't, then the ecosystem will fall apart. So we went back, we talked earlier about the Internet of Things, and we talked about IP, right, Internet Protocol. And Internet Protocol gives us our baseline. It gives us our fundamental component that connects everything around the world, our ecosystem, the foundations of it. But then on top of that, we've got to add all of the things we just talked about, the culture, you, me, creativity. All of that has to go in to create the ecosystem. Without it, if we leave bits and pieces out, the ecosystem never gets created. So for the Internet of Things to be successful, for it to do the things that we want it to do, it must not only have the base that allows all of us to be part of it, but it must add on top of that the evolutionary components. So as the Betamax evolves, as Apple evolves, as all of these other things evolve, it allows that evolution to occur. But when you have the module that shows up unexpectedly, and disrupts the evolutionary process, it must be able to absorb that as well. Now, technology is really good at the base part of this, right? Um, and people are really good at the disruptive part of this, okay? Uh, we, you know, if, I, I don't know, if you raise your hand, how many of you think you're logical people? Okay, I would tell you that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a logical person, right? We are made up of emotions. You know, uh, Susie talked a minute ago about um, teenagers and brains don't develop until they're 25 to 35 and I'm sitting here going, hey, I'm 53, I'm still not developed, okay? I'm about nine according to her scale. So, but most of us are like that. And if you start adding seven and a half billion people, right, seven and a half billion people on top of a network that consists of seven devices per person. That's 50 billion devices. And you start saying, let's mash all this together and get it to, get it to work. All of a sudden, that ecosystem has to be incredibly robust. It can't just be a little bit. It's got to be all encompassing. So let me give you an example of what we're talking about. One of the things that's really hot today is the self-driving car, right? 
That's all you hear about, you know, if you're in technology, that's all we ever hear about, is self-driving cars. Google's got one out there, Audi's got one, every, every major uh, automobile company has a self-driving car. Now let's think about that a second. If we talk about at the base level of IP, what do you want the self-driving car to do? Well, by name, you want it to self-drive, right? Well, is that enough? Can you just have it like go put it on I-15, pull the little cord and go, go, right? Wouldn't you want it to like maybe avoid the other cars on the highway? That might be a good thing, right? So at its base level, we want it to be self-driving, but there's some other components here that we got to layer on top of that. So one thing we want it to do is we want it to self-drive, okay? And we want it to avoid the other cars on the highway. Do you want it to go somewhere? Anywhere in particular? Or do you just want to get in the back seat and go drive, right? Uh, really, we want, it to, we want it to take us somewhere in particular. So we want it to be able to go where we tell it to go. Now think about this. We have it, we want to sit there, we want a vehicle that we get in, we tell it where we want it to go, it takes us where we want to go. Isn't that the car you have right now? Don't you get in your car and just drive it where you want to go? So that doesn't get us there. That's not evolutionary. That's not disruptive. Let's talk about what you really want, right? What you really want is you want the car to take you where you want to go, when you want to go, without you having to tell it. And you want to make sure it gets you there safe by the shortest route possible, knowing where all the uh, accidents are on the highway, where everything is. And you want to make sure that when you get there, preferably it gives you a sandwich on the way, right? That's what you really want. Now we're talking about something. So let's use an example of that same thing and let's take you, okay? So here you are, you wake up at eight o'clock, you wake up at seven o'clock in the morning, uh, you have a class at eight o'clock, uh, you have work in the afternoon, you realize you overslept, you're not ready to go, but okay, we'll get it done. You look down at your, what we call a phone today, which is really a smart virtual personal assistant. Now that's a mouthful, that's why we don't use that, we just call it a phone, right? But the reality is you have a smartphone. And on your smartphone is your calendar. And you realize as you look down at your calendar that all of a sudden work, which starts at one o'clock, now has a meeting scheduled at 12 that you have to go to and you can't miss. But that conflicts with your 12 o'clock class at school. So you make the quick decision and go, well, you know what, I'm gonna skip class today, I'm gonna make this meeting. So you wipe off your calendar, the class, which is automatically replaced by the meeting at 12 o'clock. So you hurry up, get dressed, you walk outside, there's your car, it's running because it's eight o'clock and it knows you have to go to class. So it's running in the driveway. As you walk up to it, it unlocks because it recognizes you. You get in and the car takes off to go to school. Now the car knows that you have an eight, uh, an eight o'clock class in the computer science building. It also knows that lot M23 is the closest lot to the door that you need to go into that's the closest door to your class. So as you're checking email on your phone, your car drives to lot 23, it pulls in and drops you off in the drop-off zone. You hop out of the car, you head on in. Now, your car is sitting there, but your car also knows, hey, I'm an electric car, right? Because it's a smart car. So it's an electric car and it realizes that it's low on charge. So it goes and it says, okay, well, where's the nearest charge? So it checks the internet, it finds out where the nearest charging station is, it heads over to the charging station and pulls in and it's wirelessly charging, so it pulls up to where it can get a, get a charge. Once the charge starts, it shuts down, it waits for the charge to finish. Now, the charging station, on the other hand, looks at you and they go, I don't know who you are, why are you here, right? And it goes, because I want to charge. And so what it does is it checks your car and once it knows whose car it is, it goes online, it checks your account, whatever payment system you have set up. It then takes out the payment for the charge. It goes ahead and charges your car. Then, you know, they're having a great time. Meanwhile, you're in class. It's now 11 o'clock. You're finishing up your 11 o'clock class um, and it's time for you to get out of class. So you walk out, but now you're in the classroom building, which is all the way on the other side of campus. And so you walk out of class and lo and behold, in the pickup line, there's your car. Why? Because it knows from your calendar that you were getting out and that's the class you had, so your car is there ready to pick you up. So you get in the car and the car starts to pull out of the parking lot to go to work, but the car goes, hey, it's lunchtime. Uh, do you want some lunch? And you go, yeah, I'd like some lunch. And the car goes, well, the last time you went to this fast food restaurant, last time you wanted lunch, do you want me to take you there again? And you go, no, I don't want, I don't want that. I, I want a salad. 
And so the car goes, okay, well, the last time you asked for a salad, we went to this restaurant over here, um, but we just got a new review on a restaurant that's on the way to work, and the reviews look really good. Do you want to eat there? And you go, no, I don't want to try a new restaurant. Just, I want to just go by the old one. And so the car goes, that's fine. So it says what you want, and you tell it what you want from the restaurant. The car then places the order for you electronically with the restaurant uh, and heads to the restaurant to pick you up, to pick up your food, and you're busy prepping for your meeting. Okay? Now, that's a really cool thing that I just showed you, and you go, wow, that's really neat. Well, the reality is that everything I just told you exists today. Every single bit of it exists right now. What doesn't exist is us connecting it all together. We haven't fully functionally created the ecosystem, but we are. It's coming, right? So as we create these hundreds and thousands of connections, as these millions upon millions of devices get connected, what happens is we create an ecosystem that is both evolutionary and disruptive and allows us to be part of it, not the end user anymore, but an actual integrated part of the system. Thank you very much.